message needs to be loud and clear to any far left activist. They're not going to come into our classrooms and indoctrinate our kid. Your rhetoric has been incredibly damaging to the state of Oklahoma. We do not want these transgender games going on in our school. We're going to remove porn from the schools and you can't stop us. I don't negotiate with the teachers union. They're a terrorist organization that is content. I didn't think at 68 years old, I would have to be concerned about public education for my grandkids going backwards instead of forwards. So we have a drag queen allegedly um, running one of our schools here in Oklahoma. This is completely unacceptable. A politician is convincing loving parents of a problem that, that doesn't exist in order to gain attention and power in his own quest for higher office. It doesn't matter how much the radical left attacks me. My message to State Superintendent Ryan Walters is it's time to stop campaigning and get to work. This is a Your Voice, Your Future Town Hall, Crisis in the Classroom. Welcome to Crisis in the Classroom, Oklahoma. I'm Armstrong Williams. In the heartland of America, Oklahoma is struggling with education. It's not immune to the nationwide challenges shaking the very foundation of our educational system. Education, the cornerstone of our personal development and societal progress, is facing unprecedented threats that undermine the potential of our youth and consequently our future. If we are to protect our nation's future, we must be committed to addressing these issues, not just as an investment in individual futures, but in the fabric of our society itself. Tonight, we will be joined by several guests to address the issues. But first, Oklahoma consistently ranks bottom in the nation in education, as a matter of fact, 49th. As the state looks to improve failing districts, low test scores, and a gap in teacher recruitment, the Oklahoma Department of Education has made national headlines for an emphasis on more controversial topics. Pushing religion in public schools, banning books that are deemed indoctrination, sounds like Florida, doesn't it? And as Fox 25, um, as Peyton May reports, ridding the classrooms of drag queens. Hi everybody, I'm Ms. Chantel, and I'm here with the Metropolitan Library to celebrate Pride. This is Chantel Mandalay, who also goes by Dr. Shane Mernon during his former day job as the principal of an Oklahoma City Metro school. Mernon's past criminal history, current after-school activities, and future as an educator, all torn apart by the State Department of Education in a timeline that starts here. Court records show the principal faced child pornography charges two decades ago. Charges that were dropped and the records expunged. But for some parents, Mernon's past and current identity can't be erased. Not only is he a drag queen, but he dresses in drag and reads children's books to children about gender. Be confident and stand up for yourself. Disputes over the principal's job went viral with a post from the popular right-wing account Libs of TikTok. And with that, State Superintendent Ryan Walters, who actually renewed the principal's certification in April of 2023, changed his tune. This is completely unacceptable. We know that radical gender theory has been a direct assault on our kids um, and we can't allow this in our schools. The Oklahoma City community weighed in in a packed school board meeting where all voices were heard. Yeah. Parents were split. If I don't like what you do in your time off, so I'm going to fire you. I don't like the charges you got were dismissed. This shouldn't even be a discussion. The conversation moved up to the state level with the Department of Ed updating the teacher code of conduct targeted at drag queen teachers. I've heard from parents all over the state who were very concerned with the left pushing sexuality on our kids, pushing transgender ideology. This month, following online outrage, state initiatives, and the district gaining national attention, Dr. Shane Mernon resigned. Big win today. The drag queen is out at Western Heights. I've demanded it from day one. This individual shouldn't be in a school. This is the individual Superintendent Walters is referring to. You don't have to be like everybody else. We're all special, and you can be special just the way you are. Joining us now is Fox 25 reporter Peyton May. You know, you've investigated um, these stories for the longest and have covered it at every angle. Was Ms. Chantel, did she have the capacity to separate her personal 
from the classroom, from being principal? Did it spill over? I think that is a question that I cannot have an opinion on. Um, obviously, I've reported on these matters. Um, I, it is my job to kind of show what others have said, what others have thought about this matter. Um, as we have talked about multiple times in my reporting, um, this was an after-school activity for the principal, Shane Mernon, um, Chantel Mandalay, as um, you have said as well. And so I think the question at hand is, does the state superintendent believe that that has any interaction between an after-school activity and um, students in the classroom or not? And I is, think is it an issue of being a role model in the optics and the perception of it all? With all due respect, I can't comment on whether or not that is an issue or not. It's not my um, job to decide that it's more of my job to report on what others around me, what the stakeholders in this issue um, have to say about that. So uh, Superintendent Walters has advocated uh, for that, that's gained some pushback here. What is it, in your opinion, in your research, is he really trying to do it? Is there other states around the country where they're doing far better in education that he's trying to emulate to change the trajectory of Oklahoma? Well, I think state superintendents' uh, policies really do mirror a lot of those Republican um, leadership across the country. So I do think that a lot of that has fallen in line with what we've seen nationally as well. Um, as I have mentioned in my reporting in the past, some of those advisors, um, some of those people that he has kind of having a seat at the table with him, um, lives of TikTok creator Kaya Rychek being one of those people, um, she definitely has that same kind of uh, voice and platform that certain content so, shouldn't be in so the classroom. So what are the policies that this superintendent is trying to implement that will change um, this crisis that parents and these kids face on a daily basis? So as of recent, um, the state superintendent has pushed a few different rules for the State Department of Education to um, pass and to implement. Now, some of those rules, um, they are not law. It is important to remember that the state superintendent cannot pass laws. He can pass rules that districts have to follow, um, or accreditation could be on the line in those circumstances. Some of those rules have to do with religion in the classroom, um, promoting Bible verses, um, promoting moments of prayer, and making sure that there's Christianity in public school classrooms, which has obviously gotten a lot of pushback since not all students in public school classrooms um, are Christian or um, have any religious beliefs. And I would say another one of those messages has to do with different DEI policies. Um, the state superintendent is looking to ban DEI for K through 12 education, um, does not want any of those programs happening. Quickly, before we say goodbye, have we seen any progress in terms of results from this superintendent since he was elected? Well, I think just more of the metrics, uh, more of the data there, since I don't have an opinion on whether or not there has been progress myself. But from what I've reported, there has been um, teachers who have, uh, he has said, have applied to fill the ranks and the gaps in our classrooms. Um, I think that is one kind of avenue that he has stressed recently. Well, thank you, Peyton, for joining us. You know, as a broadcaster and major newspaper daily owner, balance is so important to these discussions. And it's, we go out of our way to open the doors to anyone who wants to have a voice on the topic of education, especially here in Oklahoma. And believe it or not, we invited several members of the Oklahoma House, Democrats, the Oklahoma Education Association, and professional Oklahoma educators to join this very important topic today. And guess what? They all declined our invitation, but there's one person who didn't decline our invitation is the state superintendent of education, Ryan Walters, and we thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You know, you're in line, you're battled, um, and your goal is to make sure that these kids can read, write, and do arithmetic to empower teachers to give these kids the passport to the future of America. I think it's important for people to understand, forget about all the rhetoric and what has been said in your own words, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? And is there a state, a model for education that you studied that you're trying to emulate for the state of Oklahoma? Yes, sir, you know, when we look at education in Oklahoma, when I ran for this office, I talked to parents all across the state. 
and they were really clear with me. We want to be a leader in education. We want our kids to lead good lives. We want them to be good citizens of this country. And we want them to be able to get a good job. And so as we started digging into this, we looked at states like Arizona and Florida. We saw a lot of innovation. We see students that are in poverty that have the largest learning growth in the country in Arizona. We see similar models in Florida as well. It came with school choice. That's where we've championed universal school choice here in the state so that parents can choose the school for their kids. It comes with parents' rights. Parents have to be able to have control over what their kids are learning in school to make sure that there's not inappropriate material in there. We found awful textbooks and books in our schools that had pornographic material, pushed transgenderism. We've gotten those books out and our focus is on math, reading, science, and a true understanding of American history so that our kids can continue making America the greatest country in the world. But it starts with understanding America and what made America great in the first place. When can parents begin to see the results and what you're trying to accomplish for their children? Because it's what people care about. Sure. Sure. Forget about all the rhetoric, all sure. the bashing. All they care about is whether you're moving from 49 to 40, to 35, to sure. 30. Yeah, they'll be able to see it this year. You know, one of the things we've already seen in my first year in office is we had the biggest school district in the state, Tulsa Public Schools, which was also one of our lowest ranking. We came in, I demanded the superintendent be removed from office. She had done a terrible job. Kids were failing. The trajectory was terrible. We brought in a new superintendent. We brought in new types of learning. We brought in to follow student data, see how they were learning, see who needed more help. We moved administrative staff around that building. We brought in tutoring programs. They are already on pace to have tremendous academic growth in, in that school district. So the biggest school district in the state is now on the right trajectory. We have schools across the state that we're already seeing improvement upon their test scores. And you're going to see at the end of the year where they end up. But what we've been able to do is recruit teachers to the state, protect parents' rights, get a focus back to the basics. And we've used the free market by using things like merit pay, teacher signing bonuses, to be able to get more innovation in our schools. And you're going to see that in the results. What about how do you engage parents in this process? Because whatever sure. you're trying to do, in the classroom, it has to be reinforced no doubt. in the home. There's no doubt about it. I think that's one of the most important things, if not the most important thing in education, is to get parents more involved in their kids' education. So here's some of the ways we did that. We have universal school choice, so parents now have more choices. They can, they can come to a school and say, well, if my kid's not learning very well here, we'll take him somewhere else that well, does a better what job. What do you say to a parent? Because you assume that parents are always sophisticated enough and yeah. they know how the process to be a part of getting that voucher for sure. school sure. Tell parents what they need to do and what qualifies them to take advantage of this. Yeah, right here in the state of Oklahoma, we have a tax credit scholarship that we had tens of thousands of parents sign up for within the first week of launching the program. And parents sign up through a portal. They're able to then choose the school and the tax credit follows them there. So we have that. We have charter schools across the state as well. And we have the ability for parents to use that tax credit for homeschooling options as well. So we've provided more what options. What if the parents are not skillful online? They have yeah. no internet. What do they do? That's why we're constantly reaching out to parents. Mm -hmm. where we're constantly doing events around the state. We're partnering with groups to get parents more in the know about it. We're working with schools to say every kid here in the school should understand what their options are. When parents come into the school, they need to understand they have choice here. And that's what's going to be very, very important as we move forward and become a leader in education, which we're on trajectory to do that now after this first year. One of the key aspects of that is, to your point, Parents have to know, they have to be more involved. And with us as the education system, we've got to be doing that for parents. We've got to be reaching out to them. You know, in our experiences, and we cover these crises in the classrooms all across the state, especially in places like Florida, that has the best educational system yes, in this country. But well, one of the things that we found about the teachers' union is that they have this cookie cutter approach that That's one right. model fits all. Right. Every child has to adjust to this model. And we know kids learn differently. They get them enthusiastic right. about math, right. about reading, about writing. How do you make sure that you tailor this education where the child can actually learn and then not in some cookie cutter approach put in place by the teachers union, which has failed? You're 100% right. We have done that. The teachers unions have had control over our education system for decades. It has failed because to your point, every kid's unique. God created every kid in a unique way. So you've got to make sure that kids have those options. And it is different school options, but it's also inside the schools. This is where parents' rights matter inside of school. Uh, if, a, if a parent wants their kid to be college ready and go down a trajectory to take college classes, that's great. 
But what if the kid wants to do some technical skills? We've been showing off our welding programs across the state, our, our, our electrician programs. We want to get kids involved in what they're interested in and start building out these, these different types of programs. We have more aviation schools here in the state than any other place in the, in, in the country. And we want to continue to say, listen, we want industry involved. We want kids to have these different options because, again, every kid's unique and you've got to treat them that way. The, the one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work. It's got to be students, not systems. Don't protect the system. Protect the kid. Help every kid in an individual basis. That's what true education looks like. You know, people elected you because they're desperate. Not meaning that you were a desperate choice, but they're desperate. I think it's important for parents in the state to understand what has prepared you sure. for this role. Yeah, you know, the number one thing that prepared me was being a parent to four kids, being a public school teacher, being a public school teacher that was able to teach in different schools and understand what it looked like in a rural school and an urban school, and being able to take those lessons and say, this is a system that's broken. It's a system that has failed our kids. Frankly, it's failed most teachers as well. The teachers need to find innovation in schools as well. And parents want to see schools that meet the needs of their kids, that have high academic expectations, and frankly, behavioral ones as well. We've worked a lot on discipline reform here in the state, too. That's going to be part of our keys to academic success, is that when kids come into a school, the expectation is that they come in to learn. And that's something that's a culture that you have to create inside a school system. And so you start looking through all of these things. This is the blueprint for what success looks like in education. It's reform, innovation, bringing discipline back in schools, getting indoctrination out, and a laser focus on academics and academic outcomes. Much more with Superintendent Ryan Walters on Crisis in the Classroom with your moderator, Armstrong Williams. We'll be back. Welcome back to Your Voice, Your Future Crisis in the Classroom Town Hall. I'm Armstrong Williams. State Superintendent Ryan Walters touted a new teacher bonus program as an innovative and effective way to address the teacher shortage in the state. Now Superintendent Walters is on the defense, blaming the press for misinformation that led the Department of Education to try and claw back thousands of dollars they incorrectly paid several teachers. Two are even suing the department over the mess. Walter says he's looking to resolve the issue that's brought criticism from Republican lawmakers, but because he's blaming the media for this situation, we're giving you a fact check. Here's Peyton May. What we have seen is a deliberate lie pushed by reporters, pushed by the media. The controversy revolves around a federally funded program, teachers signing bonuses to recruit new educators in the classroom. Information previously reported by Oklahoma Watch stated nine teachers had to pay back the money the state sent them, teachers who may not have qualified for the program. The superintendent now says that number is smaller. There were four teachers that had this issue. We have reached out to those individuals and we've explained to them the issue. We've explained to them the falsified information. The superintendent blames the teachers for falsifying information, a claim one of the four we spoke with adamantly denies and is suing the administration for. But Walters points to the contract for the answers. They signed a contract agreement that said they didn't work in a school last year, but they did. The contract actually doesn't mention anything about previous district employment, but does explain that the money can be clawed back if information is misrepresented. Regardless, Four teachers were verified by the department, sent money from the department, and then later received letters that they'd have to return upwards of $50,000 to the department. Does your department take any accountability for sending out any of this money to teachers? Obviously, four fell through the cracks. Do you take any accountability for that? Look, we have a contract that was in place that was agreed to. We've had multiple levels of, of accountability that we built into a system. We put in clawbacks that were requirement from the feds. The superintendent says his department has been in conversation with the federal government looking for a solution. There is a path forward that does not require a, a payback from those teachers. Reporting for Fox 25 News, I'm Peyton May. Welcome back. You know, you know uh, one thing that is important for leadership is to admit sometimes when you have bad judgment, you make a mistake. And... I mean, obviously, with you as a husband with four kids, if, even if it were a mistake, I mean, if you spent $50,000 remodeling a home and taking care of other things, I mean, given the way the economy is now, sure. there's no way you're going to be able to pay that back. But I believe you to be a reasonable, fair-minded sure. person. And so what I like for you to do, to put this at rest, 
explain to them in your leadership role how you plan the latest to rest. Yeah, you know, we have the most successful teacher recruitment program in our state's history. We had over 500 teachers we brought back to the classroom to come teach our kids. We had four individuals that put incorrect information on their contract that they signed. We're working with those four individuals to keep them in the classroom to an agree to a new contract where they'll stay and they'll be able to keep the signing bonus. But the media here in Oklahoma intentionally lied about that program. They intentionally lied about what was going on with those four teachers. They used these big numbers. They acted like everything was going to be jerked back from them. That was untrue and they knew it. We're going to continue to work with teachers. We want teachers to stay in the state. And we're very proud of this program that brought over 500 teachers to the classroom. So let's, let's go to this, the issue of Chantel, the dry queen. Yep. I, I, what Chantel does, some people say, in their private life, what people do in their private life in terms of business, as long as it doesn't spill over in the classroom in a role as principal, as long as they're putting in place the guidelines which you feel are necessary to educate these kids and move them forward. With that said, why was she terminated? Oh, I, I demanded it from the beginning. When we found out that this individual was a drag queen that was uh, publicly doing these drag performances in front of young kids, you have no place in the classroom. Parents have a trust with, with, their, with the teachers to say this individual, this, this person who I'm entrusting with my kids all day when I'm not around, doesn't perform in drag shows, doesn't perform an inappropriate uh, type of behavior around kids. Now you can have a lot of jobs, but when you agree to be a teacher, you have agreed here in this state to uphold a certain level of, of behavior in the classroom and outside the classroom. And we heard from parents in the district, we heard from parents all over the state that said, I don't want my kid going to school with a drag queen as a teacher or an administrator. And that is a breach of trust with a parent. That's why parents are so angry right now at so many of our schools because of that breach of trust. And we're going to make sure that parents rights are protected and one of those is to make sure that the people around their kids are involved in appropriate material. You know, I, I, I just had a chance to, um, before you came on to talk with uh, Representative Reeves mm -hmm. and one of his criticisms of you were the fact they don't want any indoctrination in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, he calls himself a Christian. He talked about you and the Ten Commandments and what you advocated. He feels as though you've gone and doing the very same thing. Explain to us what you're trying to accomplish. Is it indoctrination? No. What, what I'm trying to do, and, and frankly, it's very common sense. You see the left, frankly, even some in my own party that try to act like this is controversial, that I'm controversial. It's really not. It's common sense. I want us to get back to an education system. A moral-based education. Yes, sir. Well, one that's focused on math, reading, science, and history. One that tells young people, we want you to live an upstanding life. Yes, we want you to live with morality. Like Absolutely. our founders. Yes, sir. When, that, like, the Tocqueville talked about absolutely. in the classroom. That's right. It was what made America greater and that's more advanced right. than any other place in the world at the time. Continue. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. And you saw him come to America and say, this is unique. This country is unique. And the founders set up with our Constitution the belief of individual rights and our Judeo-Christian heritage. That was part of our founding here. And we've stripped it from the history that we're teaching our kids. Our kids only think that America was a terrible country. I don't want them to think that. I want them to read through all of our history. That means you start with the founding, you understand what the foundation is, and you, and you look through the good and the bad and the ugly after that point, right? But you view it through the prism of what America was built on, and you try to continue as a citizen to follow America down that path where we continue to be this great country. But, but, I, but I think you're talking about something that's even deeper, that residents, re, resonates with America all across the country, whether it's in the leadership of the Congress, the courts, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in the home, it's moral clarity. Many people yes. feel that Rome and other great nations did not lose this way because of military economic might. It lost this way because of moral clarity. And more and more of that is being lost in America. And so I think what you're advocating here is moral clarity. And why is that so important if America is going to sustain itself as that shiny city on the hill? There's no doubt about it. You know, when I was a teacher, I was a history teacher. And when you study other civilizations, when civilizations forget who they are, when they forget their history, when they forget what they were called to as a people, what kept them together? Those civilizations fall apart. I truly believe that decline is a choice. America doesn't have to be in decline. We can be that great shining city on a hill again, but if our next generation doesn't understand what made America great, what are those values, how were we founded, how did we change the course of human events with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, then we will never 
never be that great country again. And, and I want Oklahoma leading the way, and we're going to continue to fight to make sure our kids understand that story. And doesn't that bring us to the classroom with the issue of discipline, self-respect, yes. yes, right and wrong, create an environment where the kids who want to learn are learning, and those that are disruptive, you've got to move them somewhere else. That it's, it's all about the respect for the classroom, but also self-respect. Absolutely. You know, when you take a child seven or eight years old and you start telling them when they act up and when they misbehave, it's not your fault, you know, you're a victim or don't worry about it and excuse the behavior, what happens? That kid grows up to believe they're not responsible for their own actions, which frankly is disrespectful to them as an individual. There's nothing more empowering than telling an individual child, hey, you can do great things. You absolutely can, but you've got to live up to a moral code. You've got to have self-discipline, and we're going to help you along those lines while you're going through school. That is key for young people to be successful, and we have allowed the left to drive those type of common sense approaches out of our schools. We've got to get them back. Discipline is going to be key in that. So, so let's, let's talk about um, what is it that you need to do The people just back up, give you a chance, for your vision to take hold and the results that you believe people will see. What is it that in terms of parents, and, and, and you said something very important, that teachers through merit, through success, yes, sir. earn bonuses, yes, sir. earn promotion. You're talking about accountability and responsibility. That's right. You know, I want the best teachers to make a lot more money. The free market works. You know, and the left has somehow won this argument with a lot of folks, and we're pushing back on this. The free market doesn't cease to exist inside a school. The free market works, and free market principles work because it's based on human nature. Okay, human nature doesn't change. And so what we know is that, again, if you incentivize great behavior in a school, you're going to get more of it. If you bring accountability to those who don't meet that standard, you're going to get less of that behavior. And so we're going to continue to have signing bonuses for great teachers. We have merit pay for those of the highest caliber. We also do bonuses when you catch a kid up who's a grade level behind and you catch them up by the end of the year, we're going to give you an automatic bonus because we want to continue to incentivize excellence in education. What you incentivize is what you'll get more of. We want academic outcomes here in the state of Oklahoma, so we're going to continue to incentivize that. You know, that. this reminds me of the very same thing in terms of the pushback that befell Ron DeSantis with DEI uh, and banning books. But when people look at the results of what he's accomplished, kids are learning, parents are satisfied, and America's future will be secure as a result of this. That's right. You know, what are we going to see? we are going to see kids have a higher quality of life because they're not going to get involved in drugs. They're not going to drop out of school. We're going to see an economic environment that's going to flourish. Why? Businesses will be able to hire more people. Our kids will be ready to advance in the workplace. You're going to see tighter-knit communities and towns because of the absence of crime and the, and the development there. And we're going to be a state that's going to lead the country because of the reforms that we're putting in place right now in education. And Oklahoma, you watch. We are going to be a leader because of the reforms that we're championing, because we are willing to fight back against an establishment, a status quo that has been in charge for so long. This innovation will work. The accountability will work. And ultimately, you're going to see our families and kids be very successful. And you could care less about race, gender, ethnicity, what matters is the child having the ability to get the most out of that classroom to prepare, prepare him for his college future or technical future if the college is the course that they decide not to take. As you said, it may not be for everybody. That, that's right. You know, college is one of those things. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to be an attorney or you want to be certain things, you need to go to college. But we're looking at kids that can earn great money being a truck driver, an electrician, a welder. And you know what? We want kids to know these are incredible jobs, too. Uh, we want you to find what your talents prepare you for, what you're interested in, and we're going to prepare you for that in the workforce. And frankly, we've seen too much of this elitism telling all kids, well, you've got to go to college. If you don't go to college, you've somehow failed. That is absolutely wrong. We want kids to know we want you to find a great place where your talents and skill set line up, and we want you to be successful. And that's for every individual kid, and every path can look different. Well, you know, we here at Crisis in the Classroom, our only agenda is truth and fact, and what empowers the kids to a better future. And the fact that you're elected by the people, at least we should do our best to give you the platform to state what your goals are. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, having the courage to come on. And that, listen, we wish you much success in your endeavor, because if you succeed, the parents and the students are the best recipient 
of your results. So thank you so thank much. Thank you very for joining much. Us. Coming up, we're hearing from a critic of Superintendent Walters, what he's doing to get past the headlines and improve education for all students in Oklahoma. Recently, I asked famed pediatric neurosurgeon, Dr. Ben Carson, and civil rights icon, attorney Ben Crump, to join me in writing a book about the failure of our national education systems. The book, Crisis in the Classroom, takes an honest look at what's wrong and how to repair the problem and invest in our children. Please take the time to order this book and get involved for your children and grandchildren. Crisis in the Classroom, get it wherever you buy your books today. Around. At a recent Board of Education meeting, the new TPS superintendent, Dr. Ebony Johnson, laid out her plan for improvement. As Fox 25's Peyton May tells us, Walters is now praising the TPS plan to bring positive results for the district. After months of back and forth and threats of TPS accreditation status on the line, State Superintendent Ryan Walters is now on the same page as Tulsa's new superintendent, Dr. Ebony Johnson. In front of the Board of Education, Dr. Johnson laid out some of her strategies to raise test scores. Getting the teachers all of the information that they need in order to teach the information to make sure that they're aligned to the Oklahoma academic standards, but then also making sure that our students are aware um, and that our families as well. Superintendent Walters has been vocal about claims of TPS's lack of progress, something he believes could change under Dr. Johnson's leadership. Dr. Ebony Johnson laid out a tremendous plan for the future of Tulsa. It's all the things that I've been asking for. It was, it was bold, it was clear, it was data driven. Walters and the Board of Education are renewing their promise to work with Tulsa's education leaders and get the district back on track. We will continue to ensure that Tulsa is going to be the successful district that I know it can be. But Dr. Johnson came uh, with a great presentation and, and clarity on how they're going to meet the goals that we've laid out for them. And, and I can't wait. Uh, to continue to work with Tulsa to get these successes in the school that I know those kids and those parents of Tulsa deserve. Reporting for Fox 25 News, I'm Peyton May. Joining us now is someone who's very determined to turn the educational system around in Oklahoma, Republican Representative Mark McBride. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You know, in, in, in a nutshell, what is the superintendent trying to accomplish versus all the pushback that you can embrace, and how can he work with all these other people involved who wants the same thing to make progress for the parents, the school, the, the kids, and the teachers? Ms. Representative McBride. Well, let's see. I, I'm not sure currently what, what uh, he's trying to do. We've had a lot of problems with the Department of Ed over the last year since he took control you know, concerns about federal funding and uh, uh, just the different things that, that he's doing that doesn't actually move education in Oklahoma forward. So I have, we have, him and I have sat down and we've, we've had a conversation recently and uh, he can go ahead and do his, his thing, but I've got a job to do as a state legislature. Constitutionally, I'm required to provide a free public education for every child in the state. And um, that's what my job is. My job isn't to, re you know, the rhetoric, the beating my chest, the uh, going after. But, but what do you think, in your experience, actually moves Oklahoma from number 49? What actually you can place in the curriculum? What is it that you need with teachers? What is it that you need with the books? What do you need to overhaul the system to make education work? and give Oklahomans something to be proud of, Mr. McBride. Number one, we need teachers. We're just like every other state in the union. We're short teachers. I passed a bill inspired to teach that recruits more teachers as a teaching scholarship for kids coming out of high school. We need, um, we need to get down to work. You know, we've, we've given two of the, the largest influxes of money into education, one in 2018, the one last year in teacher recruitment, teacher pay. We need to look at several different things and what we're doing currently is not moving us forward. We're stalled, we're stuck at 49 and we're not moving anywhere. And what's going on at the Department of Ed and I hope and pray 
that we can move it forward. I'm hoping that that uh, um, Superintendent Walters and I can work on that and move move education forward in Oklahoma. But uh, I don't see us right now moving from that 49. You know, um, last year, uh, reporters at KTL and Tulsa spoke to a Tulsa Public Schools Council who said he met a fifth grader who couldn't read um, Representative McBride. The council claimed school leadership treated the matter as commonplace. Where do you think the shortcomings stem from, and do schools take the blame? I think, honestly, a lot of the problems in education today are, you know, maybe they stem from the home, teachers not, uh, um, students not learning at home, not the desire to go to school. Reading is my number one deal. Superintendent Walters and I agree 100% on this, that we need, if you can't read, you can't uh, excel in, in life, basically. So, so I think that reading, uh, you know, get them on the right le reading level at third, fourth grade, uh, those are some things that him and I agree on and uh, um, we need to work on. But you I know, test scores following the pandemic showed less than half of students were considered proficient in math you mentioned reading and also science. Why do you feel kids are continuously so far behind? Since the pandemic, is that the question? Yes. Uh, I don't know that anybody learned anything during the pandemic. You send a kid home with an iPad or a, a laptop and they were supposed to learn. I've got, I've got six grandkids and uh, um, I think they've struggled. I think anybody during the pandemic has struggled. I, I, I would say test scores have fallen nationwide. I would guess. I don't know for a fact, but I'm just guessing. But now is time. We need to pick it up and we need to, um, hopefully our testing scores went up this last year. Are, are there schools in the state that you can point to where you're proud of the success? And what is it that they're, they're doing that other Oklahoma City public schools can emulate a model. Oh man, yeah, more Oklahoma, where I'm the area I represent. My this town I my parents went to school there. Um, we have like the fourth largest uh, school system in the state of Oklahoma. Um, we just run a top notch. We don't have any private schools really in our in but, our district. But, but tell there us are, specifically, what are they doing in the classroom? What are the students doing differently that make that separate them from anyone else? Everyone else in the state. They support the teachers and the students. I mean, the 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 teachers there love teaching there, and the students like going to school there. That's why we have not had other education alternatives move into Oklahoma or into more. So you actually believe that if you empower the teacher, give them the resources that they, that, that they need, uh, increase their pay, that is the formula that can change this trajectory going forward? It's part. What's the other part? Um, you know, we need teachers that have the desire to teach. We need, we need students that want to learn. I mean, uh, you know, I hear a lot of things from teachers about, you know, um, the problems they got within the school, but not being able to discipline, and uh, so many things like that. Uh, you know, I, and the other thing is, you know, when you talk about, you know, indoctrination one way or the other, I think a child should be able to go to school like I did, or possibly you did, and learn reading, writing, and arithmetic and not have to get caught up in all of this other stuff. Don't indoctrinate these children. Teach them history, teach them math, teach them science. So you seem to echo what Superintendent Walters is echoing, that we gotta get away from this indoctrination. Well, he would choose to indoctrinate another way. Now I am, a, I'm a Christian and I have no problem with putting the Ten Commandments on the wall, only that you know, there's the rule of law and the people of Oklahoma voted not to have religious things like that put on the wall. Um, it's, it's 
a flip side. You know, he, he's okay with indoctrinating his way, but he doesn't want it this way. And I don't want it the other way, too. But I don't know that I want him teaching my children, my grandchildren, Sunday school. So what is the balance? The balance is nothing. Now, so Read let, me, it. let me go back to something you said earlier uh, about parents. Uh, I, I think something you and I had in common, when we returned home from school, our parents reinforced education, reading, writing, arithmetic, having to go to the library. So no matter what happens in the classroom, parents must be involved in that child's educational trajectory. I agree. I totally agree. I bet you and I, I bet uh, your mom was like my mom, that you came home and until you got older, she's probably there, you know. Uh, no TV? No TV. No distractions? You sat down, you learned, you did your math problems and all that. And, and kids don't have that today. So how do you make, how do you make it to where, there, there's no way to make it to where parents have to make their children study. You're going to have to do it in the classroom. There's no way other to do it than, the, the family unit is different than it was in 1979. Well, listen, thank you for your service and your commitment, and thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Oklahoma's Crisis in the Classroom. Still ahead, a controversial appointment to the state's library review committee. Why many parents are upset. Our Crisis in the Classroom town hall continues in just a few minutes. Stay with us. Recently, I asked famed pediatric neurosurgeon, Dr. Ben Carson, and civil rights icon, attorney Ben Crump, to join me in writing a book about the failure of our national education systems. The book, Crisis in the Classroom, takes an honest look at what's wrong and how to repair the problem and invest in our children. Please take the time to order this book and get involved for your children and grandchildren. Crisis in the Classroom, get it wherever you buy your books today. Welcome back to Crisis in the Classroom. I'm Armstrong Williams. Recently, parents and teachers packed the State Department of Education meeting, protesting outside before having a word with State Superintendent Ryan Walters inside. Fox 25's Peyton May tells us why an out-of-state addition to an education committee is gaining a lot of attention in Oklahoma. Oklahomans got the chance to voice their opinions on State Superintendent Walters naming the creator of the libs of TikTok, Kaya Rychek, to a library committee. But the state superintendent made sure she was the first to talk. We are going to take back our schools. We are going to fix the schools. We are going to remove porn from the schools, and you can't stop us. Opening up the Board of Education meeting for the first time, controversial right-wing libs of TikTok creator Kaya Rychek is addressing Oklahomans on her new role reviewing our state's library books, a role Superintendent Walters thinks she's perfect for. We're really excited about having Kaya on the team. Uh, she was a national leader in shining a spotlight on this pornography in our schools. But not everyone agrees. Education advocate Sean Cummings spoke in public comment, voicing concerns about bomb threats that followed one of Rychek's posts. Her behavior brought on bomb threats. At how many of our schools? Two? How many days were they out? Six? You took somebody that threatened our children, literally, threatened our children. You have no plausible deniability if it happens again. Ratchick took the opportunity to defend herself, responding on her social media account to my video of Sean Cummings, refuting the claims that she sparked bomb threats in Union Public Schools. Regardless, the concerns from many Oklahomans remain. <laughs> In Oklahoma City, Peyton May, Fox 25 News. State Superintendent Walters wanted to answer who the other members of the Library Media Advisory Committee are, but did say they have already been meeting. Um, joining us now is Jenny White. She's the Education Director of Reclaim Oklahoma Parent Empowerment. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. You know, you, you, know, you just saw the package. What's your perspective on all this and how is it impacting the learning environment and advancing the ball in terms of education uh, and giving these chance, kids the best possibility for the future? Well, I have to say, I was a public school teacher for many years. My mother taught public school for 23 years and 
Before she retired and I retired, we taught together at a charter school here in Oklahoma City and did that for four years. And but part of the reason why we quit the teaching profession is because it came to the point where we were having trouble. Now, this was back in the 90s, or late 90s, early 2000s. We were having trouble being able to teach in our classrooms without parents getting upset and then without the uh, administration kind of backing us up. And that's part of the reason why we left. And then as I started having children of my own and we put them in public school, basically what I found was the opposite way. Um, if we tried to be involved in what was going on, then we kind of got some pushback or we got shut out or we kind of got this stiff arm or, um, and that was kind of bothersome for me. What, 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 are, what are your thoughts on the indoctrination and what um, Representative Reeves say going one way this way, too far the, this way, and what is the balance? Well, the balance is nothing. So any kind of anything outside of math and history and science and social studies, that's all for parents in their home. That's, and, and I'm really positive, uh, having been a teacher, uh, public school teacher, and I also homeschooled uh, three or four of my kids, and then also a child of a neighbor who was a single parent. And having kind of had that background, I realized that really the only way to get results is to focus on the subjects. It's to focus on the subjects. Granted, we need to have our kids critically think, but there's a way to do that without having to bring in issues that really aren't things that parents need to, to be having brought to their children's attention outside of the home. Why do you think so many parents, both in Oklahoma and nationally, are concerned about keeping school library books age appropriate? Because once again, kids are like sponges. And, and I, we have this problem, I think, today of thinking that kids are just small adults. Kids are not small adults. Um, there's part of the reason why we say when you're 18, you get to drink or you get to smoke or whatever. It's because under 18, that brain is still being developed and it's like a sponge. And anything that you put in it sticks like you would not believe. And I think anybody could remember if you've had a, uh, like in high school, for example, I took French, took three years of French. Then later on in college, I tried to take Spanish. <laughs> It was almost impossible because I kept overriding the Spanish with the French. I mean, things stick in those brains, and that's really the power of the parent and having a, a parents really pay attention to how their kids are being educated because what you pour into a child when they're very little sticks with them. And that's why parents are saying, no, this isn't appropriate at school. If I want to do that on my own time, then that's my parental right. I can do that. But that's not where my tax dollars need to be going. You know, your organization is called Reclaim Oklahoma Parent Empowerment. Uh, you know, it has to be really frustrating when you think of a state that so much of your just generations of your family has been a part of that you're ranked 49th in education. Literally, you're at the bottom. Well, how do you recover this? What is it that we're not doing to change this? And when did this all begin? I'm sure it wasn't always this way for the state of Oklahoma. Well, it's it's gone gone the other direction. I mean, we've kind of, if you look at the any of the statistics, we've gone down over the years. It's just kind of the trajectory that we've been on. But I think what really happened was when we had no child left behind, basically it left every child behind because all they were focusing on was testing. Well, testing isn't, it's rote memorization. You, you learn all your ability to be able to uh, think your way out of a, of a problem. And we quit really focusing on specific things, math specifically, English specifically, and focusing on those. We also sh have shifted to a lot of uh, online learning. We've shifted to a lot of technological learning where we're looking at iPads all the time. That's really not the way uh, studies have shown over and over again that you really learn when you're reading something and being able to touch it because two experiences, two senses are being used and that's what really helps. So we need to back off of the technology. Teachers need to be more involved in the classroom. Parents need to be more involved in what's going on with their children and helping them at home if they choose to private school 
school. But if we don't start focusing on subjects and quit focusing on testing, it's not going to get any better. Ms. White, I cannot thank you enough for joining us. And uh, we really appreciate your commitment and your love of education and your love for these children. And hopefully when we return to Oklahoma, we'll have a chance to sit down with you again. Thank you so much. As we conclude, let's remember that the challenges we face are not insurmountable. There are calls to action, calls to rally together as communities and as a nation to reinvest in what is undeniably the most significant asset for our future, education. Oklahoma has the opportunity to lead by example, to demonstrate that with effort, innovative solutions and support for our educators and students, we can overcome this crisis in the classroom. Thanks for joining us for this special. I'm Armstrong Williams.